Hi guys, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Christina Park. I head up sales here on the West Coast at Samba TV. Uh, for those that have not heard of Samba TV, we are the pioneers in ACR television data. Our technology sits within 24 different television manufacturers across 100 uh, countries globally, and it allows us to see everything that touches the glass of the screen, from linear to streaming behavior. It provides us a really comprehensive look into what people are watching and how they're watching it. And our data is available uh, for media activation uh, and for measurement. So today with me, I have uh, Naira and also Ryan. Please come on stage. Super excited about the panel. So today we're gonna be talking about building a brand in CPG fashion and retail. Um, but first off, I wanted to hand it over to you guys to quickly introduce yourself, tell us a little bit more about your background and your current role. Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Ryan. I'm a senior brand manager at Hopwater. Uh, for those of you who don't know Hopwater, uh, we're a non-alcoholic beverage startup based here in Venice. Um, so my background, I'm originally from Southern California, so not too far from here, actually. Uh, I spent about 10 years out in North Carolina between undergrad, postgrad work, and grad school. Um, started my career in management consulting and then pivoted to the much more fun uh, space of CPG, brand management, food and bev, uh, and, and absolutely love it. Um, I started kind of that phase of my career at The Wonderful Company, so based here in LA. Um, many of you may be familiar with they own Wonderful Pistachios, Fiji Water. Um, had a great opportunity there to kind of work across every brand within their portfolio, everything from luxury wine to Fiji Water itself, which is an incredible brand to be a part of. So we got experience in fresh produce, salty snacks, food and bev, um, really loved that. And, and in my time there, I met you know, a mentor figure who ended up leaving Wonderful to start his own thing. Um, and he reached out to me at that time just to kind of bring me along and, and see if I wanted to join. And, and that company happened to be Hop Water. So um, he kind of asked if I would help come out and build out their marketing function with him. And I don't think I really knew what I was getting into at the time. I ended up being employee number three. Uh, which was very early stage, uh, but have had an opportunity to grow the brand, really build it out from, from scratch. And today we have close to 30 employees. We're sold in you know, 3,000 retailers nationwide um, and has been a really fun journey to kind of scale that brand. So super excited to be here with you all today and, and talk a little bit more about it. My name is Niara Nicholas. Um, so I'm also a native Californian, but I'm from Northern California, um, Sacramento. And um, yes, Northern California. We get some love. Um, so, you know, starting across the, the whole kind of career portfolio, um, graduate of an HBCU, Florida a and University, <laughs> um, where I have an interesting um, path, you know, to where I am now. I studied chemical engineering and started my career at the Procter & Gamble company. Um, actually really technical. Um, I was working in process development in third world countries, um, developing countries, I should say, and really working on new business models. And, you know, from that time, they really decided that, you know what, it's great to be philanthropic, but we were in the business of making money, kind of transition that product into um, being sold to another company. And I was like, okay, well, where do I go from here? And started looking into what my options were and started working in product development um, for Folgers. And what's interesting, and, and we'll get into this a little bit when we talk about brand building, is that, you know, at the time I was like, what am I going to do except for get people over caffeinated and fat? And, you know, when you think about, you know, really the impact that you might be able to have on people, I had a manager at the time who was like, you know, when you think about what you're doing and when you work for our brands, you have to think about people like that mom who wakes up every morning and just needs that cup of coffee just so that she can be the best parent she can be to get their kids out the door. And it was at that point in time, I was like, wow, you know, it doesn't always matter what I specifically am working on is not for me to judge, it's for me to be able to make products that I really feel are going to be the best and really impact people's lives. So from there, um, I started working, um, I worked on Folgers for a little bit and then transitioned into working for Always, um, launched um, their Always Infinity product, which was a game changer product. I worked on the final um, formulation product design for that. And then they launched it and the product didn't do well. Like, you know, they were like, but it's the best thing. It's the best, it's the best. You know, p is known for being the best. But what was important is like, people already know you're the best, but what's in it for them? 
So, you know, when we talk today about really brand building, it's like, how do you think about that? And so, you know, I really work to be able to identify what were the points of differentiation and worked with marketing and the agencies and stuff to really relaunch it. And now it's one of their most successful products and knew at that point in time, I wanted to get closer and closer to the consumer. So from there, transitioned into working at J&J, um, you know, for a while on the Neutrogena brand, worked in insights and um, integrated marketing there. And, and loved it. You know, I think between both of those companies, it really helped me to think about brand building. And then from there, um, I'm now working at Estee Lauder, working in product marketing for Glam Glow and product development on Smashbox, and really taking a lot of the things that I learned previously in my career to really impact how do we execute things from a prestige level, especially now that we think about it from an omni-channel and even some of the challenges potentially for some of the brands that I'm working on right now. Yeah, that's great. And I love uh, the journey that both of you have had um, and the backgrounds that have led you to this role. So I think it's interesting because each of you kind of represent um, different verticals um, at different life cycles. Um, what would you say is critical in terms of any component for building um, brand strategy? Yeah, um, so I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is having a deep understanding of your consumer. I think it's probably boilerplate for everyone in this room, but I think for us at Hopwater specifically, you know, we're a young startup that doesn't have the, I wish I had the research capabilities that P&G has, you know, but we still overinvest, you know, from our side in the research that we can do. And for us, you know, we've been fortunate to be able to do focus groups, uh, design packaging studies, um, you know, consumer interviews, surveys, all to really kind of gather as deep of an understanding of our consumer as we can get. And I think from that, you get the insights that lead to the strategy that helps to build the brand. Um, and I think for us initially, we've had, you know, kind of an interesting journey. Our initial hypothesis in building the brand was that it was going to be something that appealed to the male consumer. We thought late 30s, trying to fight off the dad bod, loves an IPA, but, you know, reaches for a hot water instead, you know, on their nights off. So we kind of like started with that as like the initial interpretation of who the brand would be for. Um, and through the research, we learned pretty quickly that like that actually wasn't the case, that we actually had more of a female skew. And so about 60% of our consumers are female now, um, and they're kind of the health-oriented moms. They're 25 to 44, they have health and, and productivity goals that they focus on, and they reach for hot water as kind of an all-day refreshment, but also as something that helps them to like step back into those social moments. So for us, like having that understanding allowed us to kind of course correct like how we go to market and how we you know talk about the brand um, and what that looks like. And that's changed everything from our messaging strategy to the influencers and the partners that we work with. Um, but I think that's like step one is really investing as much as you can in that from the jump so you can get you know really clarify that understanding. Completely agree. I think the thing that I would add to that is the fact that you need to be able to establish what your objective is, even before you determine who your target is, because that could make a difference in who you are going to target, you know, between if your objective is to build penetration, which, you know, on the brands, one of the brands that I'm working on, Glam Glow, was one of the objectives. You know, facial care masks, you know, were relatively, they're not as penetrated as the rest of facial skin care. You know, how do you go ahead and determine that? So who would be potentially your easiest targets to be able to do that? Um, also, in thinking about who are going to be the people that you want to reach out to, like Ryan was saying, like, is it going to be the person whose facial skin care involved? Is it going to be somebody who maybe doesn't know a lot or maybe somebody who always goes and gets um, facial care treatments because it is a specialized treatment um, product? So when you think about, you know, what is the objective that you're trying to do, whether it's, you know, penetration, switching, et cetera, and then among who your core target is, I think those are some of the things that are really important in asking those questions. And then, you know, also, you know, going back into, you know, what we were talking about before is knowing who your brand is, um, you know, like the personification of the brand. I think a lot of times we may think like a brand is just the logo or, you know, it's a, a little bit about products. And, you know, even for myself, I used to look at myself, you know, even my titles are product marketing and product development, like a product builder. But really what you're trying to do is to be a brand builder. 
um, and really try and think about every product that you launch. Is it going to be actually contributing to the equity of your brand or is it going to detract from it? Because the more you launch products that are a you know, detraction from your brand, the more you are eroding. It's, it's so difficult already to penetrate the market, um, especially, you know, I work in, in skincare. It's so saturated. And so if you go ahead and you detract and you have to make your, your consumers think too hard about what you're building, you are off strategy. You are not contributing to your brand, even though you're launching a product. So those are just some of the things, you know, I think about. Yeah, that's great. And I think both of you kind of talked about how important insights and research is when developing your brand strategy. Um, in your experience, what are some go-to tools or resources that you guys lean on to build brand strategy? Um, so, you know, I think we talked about a lot about insights. I think that's obviously like king for us. I think, you know, in building hop water and again, I think strategy for us probably looks much different just given the stage of where we're at and what our objectives are to your point. Yeah, I think for us, we've had a lot of success in old school CPG blocking and tackling. I think, you know, for us, we were a brand that launched in the pandemic. We launched in August of 2020, which is, you know, probably the worst time to launch a brand um, fully remote. And because of that, we didn't have as much opportunity to interact with consumers IRL and sample the product. But coming out of that, we've invested a ton in sampling and driving trial as much as we can. So like trial driving is like one of our primary objectives. And so we do that in a couple of different ways, uh, in-store demos. So literally at the point of purchase, sampling the product, but also Gorilla street team sampling, old school Red Bull style cans out on the street. Um, but then we do you know events and sponsorships. So this past year we worked with Tough Mudder, Spartan Race to meet our consumers where they are and get a cold can in their hands. My team likes to joke that cans in hands, liquid to lips is like the mantra of our team. Um, but so much of that is is our focus. And as you may have seen, I snuck some cans into uh, the break room earlier today. So that was, there we go, yep. Um, so, so trial driving has been like one of the biggest focuses for our team. Um, and I think what we found is, you know, our product requires some education. You know, we're building a new category here. It has functional ingredients in it that many people haven't heard of before. Um, but when they try the product, they love it. And when they love it, they want to tell their friends about it and share it. And that kind of leads to the second part of the strategy, which is having a strong referral engine. So you think about like driving trial and then having a strong referral engine, you know, I think all of us in our friend groups and our families have someone who is like the referrer who like always shares the new products. I think everybody wants to be that person or wants that person in their network. And hot water is, it fits perfectly into that. It's something new. It's something exciting. It's something that's good for you. It makes you feel good. Um, so driving trial, getting people to taste it, having a strong referral engine to create kind of this virtuous circle of people trying it, referring it to their friends. I mean, there's nothing like a word of mouth referral for a small brand like us, like that just cannot be beat. So I think those two things working in parallel is where we spend a lot of time. And I think on the referral side that both has like an online component, you know, pure play DTC, referral programs, all of that, but it also has an offline component as well. Building a group of brand ambassadors and affiliates who, you know, feel empowered, you know, to wear a hot water sweatshirt and go out and sing your praises, uh, you know, to, to their community. So I'd say those two things um, are really important parts of our strategy. Yes, um, I definitely have a, a affinity towards insights. I actually spent a lot of my career um, working in insights, so it's important. And even you know, right now, I do work on two brands that are some of the smaller Estee Lauder brands. So we don't have the same amount of resources that you would see from you know an Estee Lauder or a Clinique brand. So we have to be a lot more scrappy. But at the end of the day, insights are so important. And, and one of the tools that I personally like to use and, and have used even. Um, when you know I've consulted and I've worked with startups is really segmentation and really understanding and um, being able to personify who your consumer is. And I think you know really that helps from the perspective of like when you ask yourself, would this person want this product? Why would she want this product? So even as you know I develop concepts, and you know, work on concepts, it's really about understanding. If you understand this is the psychographic behavior of this consumer, so you know, giving an example, you know, for instance, within skincare, is it somebody who is really involved, they really wanna understand what are the core ingredients that are in a product versus what it looks like or the, the cachet of it, then that means that you need to ensure that you're putting in ingredients that are going to connect to the product benefits, that they have some level of relevance, that they can be researchable. That's very different from, you know, 
for instance, I work on Smashbox now where it's about the visuals, the color, the consumer really wants to be able to do that. Is it about empowerment? Is it about, you know, really for them to show a professional? Like those are very different ways that you would go ahead and, and execute a product and a product design. And then that still ladders back up into being able to understand what is your brand health? What what is your where do you stand? What does your brand stand for? Because the way that you would execute some of those things is going to be very different depending on what your brand is. So, you know, you have to use those types of tools really to be able to understand how do you deliver a differentiated product that goes back into what I was saying. Is it going to be an ad and continue to build your brand or is it going to be a detractor? Um, which is something that, you know, when I've worked in my past, I have been, when I worked on integrated marketing, I was amazed at how the company, the impression of like what the equity of the company was, was very similar to the people that worked there that were similar to, and it didn't matter, I traveled around the world. I was in Brazil or Taiwan or, you know, France. It didn't matter that the actual consumers who used the product were still a personification of the employees of the, the brand impression itself. And so, you know, really when it comes down to it, it's like those tools should really help you to be able to like solidify who is the person that we're talking to. And that's really, you know, what I try to use from an insight perspective. No, that's great. Um, so we talked about challenges a little bit, which I think are unique for, for both of you. So um, for Hop Water, it's fighting for shelf space, right? Um, especially when you're, you've kind of invented a brand new category that might not necessarily exist. Um, or it might be um, trying to expand your brand um, and then trying to weigh the balance between um, expansion and then kind of deterring away from the brand itself. Um, so what would you say are some of the biggest challenges you face as you work, work to kind of grow and expand your brand? Um, and how are you working to resolve them? So um, one of the challenges that um, we're experiencing on my Smashbox brand right now, which is a, a great opportunity and a challenge at the same time, is that they are transitioning now from um, being in specialty like a Sephora um, to Mastige, which is Ulta, where you have both your mass brands and your prestige brands there, into now we're also at Ulta at um, Target, which is now a mass. And Estee Lauder in general typically has, you know, been established as more of a relationship type of company. You know, it started with counters. It started with the founder who would go and, and you know, talk to people. You know, it has a massive education team, um, you know, working with the Black Coats at Sephora. So, you know, you had people who could sell your brand for you or tell you what the product does. So one of the challenges now, you know, working on a, a you know, brand like Smashbox is how do you go from people selling your product for you to you being able to sell it in that quickly? And so that's where some of my mass CPG um, comes into play, where it's like, how do you make the product ideas so clear, so succinct and eye catching that it can exist on its own when you're in mass? versus you know, having somebody to tell you what the product benefits are. And so that's one of the big challenges that you know, I'm continuing to work on that goes into you know, some of the things that I've talked about already, like what is our point of differentiation? What does the brand stand for? Who are we developing this for? So we can make it that quick and that much you know, more easily digestible when they are there in mass. Yeah, and I, I think for us at Hot Water, essentially we were talking about this question yesterday and I was like, trying to figure out what would be like the biggest challenge that we have. Cause we, I feel like are constantly problem solving like all the time at hop water and our kind of like internal ideology is like, if we're not always problem solving, like we're not pushing enough, we're not moving fast enough. So like had to do a little thinking about like the biggest challenge, but I think the one that, you know, really sticks out to me would also be the opportunity and that's expanding into retail. I mean, we started as a DTC brand shipping direct to consumer. A lot of our senior leadership team kind of comes from that background. So building the retail muscle was something that was net new to us. And I think anyone who's made that journey or anyone who's just tried to sell even an incremental skew into retail can tell you like how difficult that can be. And especially when you're a small brand that's competing against the likes of AB InBev and Molson Coors and all of those folks. And I think the additional layer of complexity is like with this being a new product in an emerging category, like selling the story to the decision maker and to the buyer because I think they have their preconceived notions about what the product is and where it should sit and their clearly defined shelf space and planograms and definitions and such. And I think for us, like our desired shelf set 
is the non-alcoholic beer set. Like that's where we feel like we belong. That's feel like we, where we feel like we can win. But oftentimes a buyer will say, well, you look more like a sparkling water. You belong over there next to LaCroix. And how do we like overcome that challenge and get our desired shelf set to really drive the velocities that we need off of the shelf? And what we found to do that is really arming our sales team, arming our teams with the tools that they need to complete that selling story. And so for that, case studies of retailers that have put us in the desired shelf space, showing them what those turns can be, leveraging you know, the consumer insights we talked about earlier, third-party data, all that stuff to tell them about like, hey, non-alcoholic beverages are here. You know, The category itself grew 30% last year. Um, we're really building the shelf of the future and like bring us into that decision-making process with you, like help us craft that narrative together as we like build this category. Um, so arming the teams with the tools to complete the selling story, but then the second part of that is showing the retailer that you have and are willing to invest to pull the product off the shelf once it's on. So supporting it once you get on the shelf with in-store demos, shopper marketing, point of sale. So it's kind of like a two-part approach, but that has been our biggest challenge, but it also is our biggest opportunity as we kind of grow from this small DTC brand to you know our pursuit of being a nationwide you know, retail-focused brand. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so switching gears a little bit um, and talking about kind of your advertising and your marketing strategy. So I think earlier today we heard about the question of what is it um, the platform that determines the messaging and the content? Is it the creative first? Um, so I guess from a kind of marketing and advertising standpoint, um, how do you guys make sure that you guys get heard above all the noise and reach consumers, right, in what is one of the most fragmented kind of media markets today? Yeah, I can, I can take a step first. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a challenge that probably every brand faces. I think, like, there's just so much noise out there. Um, I think, you know, we don't have the luxury of the big budget to do the Super Bowl commercial. Um, you know, we don't have necessarily the budget to, like, invest in all the channels that we would like to the full capacity that, that I want. Um, so I think, like, we have to think about things that have, like, a low cost, high ROI. What are those things that we can really drive visibility in? So I think like we do two things. One is we continue to invest in content. I think like a large portion of our budget goes to content. I feel like content is just like this never ending machine. You just have to like feed the beast where it's just like, whether it's on paid social, whether it's video content. Um, so I think like investing in high quality content that you can then leverage across the platforms is something that like we pride ourselves on, especially when we view like, you know, we often compete against, you know, non-alcoholic beer brands or other brands that are just a single hop water skew within a larger portfolio. Those aren't like lifestyle brands. Like we envision ourselves along with the Essentias and the Olipops, like we're a modern beverage brand and like content is like king in that world to create that lifestyle kind of aspirational feel. So investing in content is key. But I think one thing that we've also had a lot of success with is leveraging brand ambassadors. And so these aren't like just kind of like run of the mill, like just normal lay consumers who are friends. Like we leverage those folks as well. but. As far as like breakthrough goes, we've had, you know, we've been fortunate enough that we've had, you know, celebrities, yeah, folks with large audiences and communities who are authentic fans of the brand. So Dustin Poirier, who's a champion MMA fighter, is actually fighting at UFC 281 this weekend. Um, he's a part owner uh, in the brand and came to us organically. Um, Kaisa Kiernan is a wellness activist and fitness enthusiast. She's got you know, a million followers on IG. Jennifer Love Hewitt, those folks who have just like come to us naturally that like we're not paying you know them six figure salaries to you know create content for us but they have large platforms we can you know arm them with the product and, and the tools and then they can share that with their communities and like because they're so authentically you know in love with hop water and the product itself like they speak to it better than we could anyways you know what i mean and so we can tap into the equity that they have with their communities so i think investing in content and then leveraging our ambassadors as like a high roi low cost initiative has helped us kind of break through I would agree. I think the the build that I would add to that is just really being able to understand like what your brand voice is and who those brand ambassadors best could be. I think one of the things that, you know, especially on a couple of the brands I work on, even though Glam Glow is a facial skincare brand, what it's known for is being able to give instant results. And so when you're leveraging some of those things, when you're thinking about your media outlets, it's like, how can you best um, be able to communicate that in a really clear and concise way? And so, you know, even with some of our masks, we show how they're they're clearly differentiated from you know some of our competitors you know being able to identify who are those people that really align with the brand that can kind of be like 
for instance, Glam Glow's a little bit tongue in cheek that, you know, are going to make it a little bit more engaging and in line with what the, the brand stands for, because that's going to be something that's going to be much more memorable than, you know, potentially like we don't necessarily want to go after um, somebody who's super crunchy or anything like that. You know, that's going to be a real big departure. So how do you optimize who are going to be those brand ambassadors? What is going to be your your tone of voice? What is it that you're trying to communicate? Because, you know, even for the brands that I work on, they also do have smaller budgets, you know, from that perspective. And it's like, how can you maximize that really be able to also identify what your channels are. Because I think, you know, a lot of times we even heard earlier, it's like, oh, you know, it's TikTok, it's TikTok. And yes, TikTok is the the channel right now that, you know, everybody's thinking about. But if you have an older consumer segment, like for instance, Smashbox is, you know, probably millennial, which is funny to call them older, but, you know, um, you know, they, you know, aren't necessarily only on TikTok. So how do you also, you know, identify where you are and the way that you would execute your media in that that case is going to be very different from the way you would on TikTok. So how do you, once again, going back into who's your core target, what is your tone of voice, what are the, you know, um, media platforms that are going to be most optimal for you, and then what is going to be that execution that's going to align with what your objectives are? Awesome. Um, Ryan, and I see some hop water right there. Um, yes, I love it. Hands and hands. <laughs> Um, all right, so getting uh, a little bit more serious here. Um, so obviously, as you know, the economy has seen a lot of changes over the past few years, uh, from the pandemic to the downturn we're experiencing now. Um, how Can you share kind of how this has made an impact on your brand strategy overall? Um, absolutely. So one of the things um, as we're working on Smashbox, like I said, we're going into channels that are now much more accessible. So you think about an Ulta or a um, Ulta Target. But one of the things that we also are looking at is from the perspective is that now people really want to maximize their money and their time. So some of the, the core products that I work on, like one of the things I work on is um, primers. We're really trying to reestablish, like, how do we think about it from an overall value proposition? If you use a primer, it allows for your makeup to last longer. You don't have to apply as much foundation. It also allows for you to go ahead and, you know, get that blurred, you know, nice look in less amount of time. So now you're able to potentially save, you know, on product usage, you're able to save on time, like really thinking about it from that perspective of like how right now between the recession and just some of the things that you know we've had to go through within the pandemic how do you ensure that you're delivering and developing products and product communication that's really going to improve you know people's lives during these times yeah i mean i completely agree i think having the product specs to like prove out the value in in that is, is so key I think, you know, rewinding, I mentioned a bit that we launched initially in the pandemic in August of 2020. And I think the pandemic has, in a strange way, probably provided the biggest opportunity for our brand, um, which I know like, we're very fortunate to be able to say that. But if you rewind to like the beginning of the pandemic days, you know, many of us, myself certainly included, were drinking more alcohol than we were stressed. We were stuck inside watching Tiger King and <laughs> opening wine and IPAs at night and stuff. and. You know, it's not just anecdotal. I mean, if you look at the at the data, there was a 15 to 20 percent consumption of alcohol in the U.S. in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and so, I think what happened after that, you know, we launched, you know, in the, in the thick of that, and then there was a course correction, and that consumers really pulled back, and moderation became, you know, the really the, the term and the focus. And consumers were now hungry for non-alcoholic options and better non-alcoholic options. They still wanted to be able to participate, and they didn't want to miss out. But they didn't want to drink the O'Doul's and, you know, the things that, that you know, or just a sparkling water uh, that they'd had before. And they wanted something new. And fortunately, like, at that time, we'd built the brand. We, you know, figured out what the liquid should taste like. We'd begin to, like, create a brand that people were, you know, found appealing and engaged with. And that provided significant tailwinds for our business. And we were able to really capitalize on, on that. And I think what we've seen is that trend of moderation has continued to, to grow. I mean, I mentioned that... You know, the non-alcoholic beverage category was up, I think it was 33% over the last year. You look at, you know, I think they say it's 40% of adults in the U.S. report that they don't drink alcohol anymore. It's the highest it's been in two decades. Um, something like a dry January, 35% uh, of people were reported that they participated in dry January last year. That's up nearly 2x from, from years before. So I think this is very much a, a trend that's here to stay. And 
you know, we pre present, presented with this tremendous opportunity, and now our focus is on how do we continue to grow the category? How do we continue to educate folks that there are great tasting NA options out there and really capitalize on that momentum? I love that. Um, all right, so last question for me, and then I'll hand it over to the audience. Um, so what is one key piece of advice that you would offer a brand marketer um, that might be in a similar position to yourselves? Oh, man. Um, I think I would say prioritizing quality is probably the first thing that, and I think even back to my experience at Wonderful with our wine brands in Fiji Water um, and through to today at Hop Water, I think when you have a quality product, I think this goes back to what you were talking about with really understanding what the objectives are and specking out the product accordingly, but like when you start from a base of a high quality product that really solves a consumer need, that makes everything so much easier. It makes the storytelling part so much easier. And I think taking the time to invest up front to really get that right um, is, is critical. So I think like that's where I would say like investing up front to make sure that the liquid in the can or the, the product in the box, whatever it is, is high quality and adds value and meets the needs of your consumer. So I don't think that's anything terribly groundbreaking, but I think that's something that's especially important today and going forward into this kind of uncertain economic environment as consumers are going to become more discerning about their spend and more discretionary with their spend. Um, for me, I, you know, I'm a researcher at heart, and to me, it goes into really asking the questions of what and who your brand is. So, you know, understanding how was it um, founded, who started it, what is your founder's story, how did it evolve, even if it's been an acquisition, you know, what happened, what were some of the attributes there, being able to look at, you know, previous advertisements, look at the social media, what is the brand voice, really being able to put yourself into like what is important to this brand and almost person personifying the brand itself, because that really helps for you to ask those additional questions on what is it that I can go ahead and do to make this brand better how can I make it better for the consumers that we identify with? Um, because I think sometimes, and I've seen this, you know, like I said, I've just you know, been doing this for a while, and sometimes we'll look at competitive brands. And I think especially now in beauty care, we're seeing so many brands that you know, really came out within the last five to 10 years that are really starting to kind of flounder. And you know, I've worked on brands that have been around for like 50, you know, 100 years. And you know, it's, it's really important to be able to understand if you're going to continue the longevity of that brand, that it's not just about trying to be the next Me Too or you know, trying to think about that you're just going to do this. It's like, what are the principles that the brand stands for, which goes back into that level of authenticity? Who, are, who is it that you're really trying to target? And you know, what is it that you are trying to do for the long run, not only for today, but even as you think to the future? We, we look at and we talk about our CAGR but I don't think we always think about our equity in the same way that we do about our p &L. And so for me, it's really being able to, you know, like that adage says, unless you know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. And so it's really being able to kind of understand the history in order to make sure that your future is even better. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, hi, I'm Allie Taren. I work at the Trade Desk. Um, how do you guys think about agencies today? Obviously, you know, agencies, PR, creative, media, play critical roles in the work that you do. But uh, but it's a I'm, it's a challenging space, I think, in the agency world. How do you rely on your? What do you really? How would you prioritize what you're relying on uh, for your agencies right now? And um, well, I don't work at an agency. I'm just curious. What guidance do you have in terms of agencies really creating differentiated value for the challenges that you have? Yeah, I, I can take a, a stab at that one. Um, I think, you know, our team is, is lean and, you know, we don't have a ton of headcount. And so because of that, by nature, we're reliant on outside help, whether it be in the form of contractors or, or agencies. Um, and I think we've experimented with a lot of different agency partners. And I think like that's, you know, sometimes you see immediate value. Other times you need to test them out to, to find someone who's like a really good fit with your stage and the size of your brand and your objectives. I think some of the things, and we're kind of going through a, kind of like a resource revamp right now to, to kind of 
structure ourselves for 2023 and beyond. But I think some of the things that we've been thinking about, obviously there's a cost component to it. So like for us, like sometimes like the white glove agencies like aren't necessarily in our grasp at that time, but finding someone who can like meet your budgetary needs, which is kind of top of mind for us. But then also people who have like functional expertise or industry, industry expertise. So like some of the agencies we've been working with, like asking about, do you have experience within beverage? Do you have experience with brands of like at our stage and helping them scale to the next level? Because we've you know grown tremendously in 2022, but our goals are, and, and ambitions are steep for 2023 and beyond. It's like, can you help us take us to the next level? And do you have the experience within our industry specifically to make us do that? I think the other thing too is really pressing them to like work with, you know, albeit maybe a smaller budget, but like what are those things that can have a 10x ROI that you can help us do? What can we do that's like disruptive that can break through and stand out? And like, do you have examples of how you've been able to show other brands do that in the past? So like really kind of looking to case studies, looking to like experience within the industry. Those are some things that we've been pushing on as we've been kind of going through that process right now. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, so our creative agency at Estee Lauder is in-house. And then, you know, of course, you know, for our media and stuff, like we work with the agencies there. But it to me, it's no different whether you're working with an external agency or, you know, internal. Um, it really comes down to what we've talked about up here, which is like the insights and really making sure that you are as clear as you can be on what your objective is and who your consumer target is going to be. And, you know, when you... Um, basically, and you know, it's the same, like, I think I saw this earlier today, when you are trying to talk to everybody, you're talking to nobody. And so, you know, I don't think it's always just about the agency um, and the agency partnership. I think sometimes, you know, as the client, you also have to be really clear on what you want. Um, and that can also lead to being able to identify who is the appropriate agency for you as well, going back into what you're saying, like, you know, can you use a white glove agency? Is this agency, have they produced things that you, um, you know, really like, you know, who are the the partners, you know, some of the, the companies I've worked with have, you know, worked with really large, um, you know, agencies. And so, you know, within the agencies, they of course have, you know, their teams, you know, are they aligned with, you know, your vision? Do you feel like that's something that um, you think that they can really execute and being really clear about what it is that you, you, you want from them? So, you know, I think that's what, you know, when I think about agencies, it, it kind of comes down to what do you as a brand need and want and being able to articulate that clearly. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Excuse me. Hi, I'm Hannah. I work for Neutrogena, so I'm um, very resonated with a lot that you've said. And I was actually looking at the can, and I was looking at kind of the three hero ingredients, and it reminded me of a lot of the work that we're doing on the brand to kind of pull out our hero ingredients in skincare products. And um, I feel like, you know, consumers today have a much higher expectation from the brand to speak about what is actually in the product and no longer trust a lot of the claims that are just the simple benefit. Um, so I would love to hear you both talk about your experience with that and how you communicate um, what is in the products in a simple way that encourages consumer trust, but doesn't overcomplicate, of course. I could cheat and tell you about the example on Neutrogena that I did, but... Um... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I really, it does come down to simplicity. And once again, like what I said, you know, what is the benefit that people are looking for and how do they want it communicated? So I am going to use Neutrogena. Um, so, you know, launched Neutrogena Hydra Boost. And what was interesting about Neutrogena Hydra Boost is that it was already a product that, um, was a knockoff product for Laneige Water Bank in Asia, and really trying to be able to understand how we could globalize that product. It was a little different, especially in Western worlds where um, hyaluronic acid at the time, which is crazy. Now everybody knows what hyaluronic acid is, but when I was working on it, people were calling it hydraulic acid, okay? Um, they were like, oh, this hydraulic acid, why would I want to put that on my skin? Um, and, you know, what was 
really necessary was to try and communicate in a really simplistic way how you would be able to deliver on a benefit. And at the time, like I said, hyaluronic acid was not well known. So being able to communicate, one, that it absorbs a thousand times its weight in water, which is like, okay, but what's the so what? And so, you know, we worked even like with the, the demo, the insight really was like your skin doesn't bounce back like it used to. Um, and it was targeted towards the millennial at the time because they um, essentially weren't ready for anti-aging, were out of um, acne, but didn't want a heavy you know, cream. So really being able to now talk about that the way in is through hydration and through water, not through heavy oils, and that you know, being able to bounce back. And so giving that visual demo, we had Kristen Bell, I remember she would touch her skin and her cheek would bounce back, um, gives you the visual representation of what that ingredient, hyaluronic acid, which absorbs a thousand times its weight in water. Um, so, you know, going back into thinking about like from a perspective, like ingredients are super important, but like right now people are kind of like, oh, I just want it because it's like the hot ingredient It's really like, well, what's, what's in it for you and connecting that back into the insight that you have for, um, whatever product. So like even right now, um, my Glam Glow product is, um, Super Mud is our hero product. It has six different acids in it, <laughs> so which is even more difficult to communicate. But the point that we dif we communicate instead is that you have you know all of these different the super six acids can target whatever your skin needs are. It's a super product because it can address you know um, acne, oil, rough skin, dull skin, you know all of these different things. So trying to think about even if you have something as complicated as that how you can simplify it and really meet the insight that you want. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all that. And I love this question. Thank you for asking it. Um, yeah, I think at Hot Water, we're, we're fortunate in that we have a lot of things to talk about, a lot of good things to talk about. And we've really kind of had to bifurcate between what are like the benefits and what are the features and what is kind of the hierarchy and messaging across that. And I mean, we spent months and, and so much time of surveys, interviews to really understand like what of those do consumers care about the most. And the output of that is like a single slide that we have that essentially takes all of our reasons to believe and just stack, stack ranks them as far as like, okay, if we have 30 seconds at the shelf, like what are the three things that we're saying? If we have a longer form you know, opportunity to talk with a consumer, like what are the secondary you know, reasons to believe? Um, and so for us, you know, what we found is like non-alcoholic is like far and away the number one thing. I think an aha moment for us is like the functional benefits that you saw on the can, ashwagandha and L-theanine, which for those who are unfamiliar provide kind of a relaxing, unwinding, de-stressing, calming effect. Um, that is very much like a secondary benefit. Um, you know, there are other beverages out there where like function is, is first, but for us we found that non-alcoholic flavor and health specs really come before function. So doing the hard work to figure out what that stack rank is, um, has been really important. But I think at the same time, like you do need to make sure that you have that information available for the consumers that are seeking it regarding your ingredients. And so whether it's the hot varietals that we use or the ashwagandha that we have, um, making sure that like that information is clearly available, it's thorough, it's detailed. Um, so I think all of that is, is table stakes at this point. To your point, I think the modern consumer expects that. Um, but I think the challenge is what you mentioned is like connecting it back to the insight and really figuring out what that prioritization is so that you're maximizing the time that you have to message with your consumers. All right, thank you so much. Let's give it up for these guys. <laughs>